We are in week two of a series uh, entitled Behind Enemy Lines. I told you guys last week when we kicked this thing off that uh, I wanted to just share from personal experience um, what I have gleaned and seen. Uh, and really, um, you know, it's, it's important to recognize that we are caught up in the middle of a battle. I don't know whether you know it or not, but there is a battle going on. There's a battle for our souls. Uh, and, and a lot of times we think battle for our souls means that's a battle uh, whether or not we're going to heaven or hell. And there is a battle for that too. But once you get saved, you put your trust in Jesus. If you uh, And you continue to seek him, then, then that's a done deal, right? We don't have to earn our salvation. You don't have to keep your salvation. It's a free gift and you receive it and you operate in it. And you're going to go to heaven and we thank God for that. But the battle for our soul is really the battle for our minds. And the enemy is after your mind because if he can't send you to hell, he at least wants you to feel like you're living there. And so I, as I was looking and, and seeing how the enemy has, has operated in my life, I, I found that usually there's like a four-stage process, a four-stage cycle that I go through when I'm under attack, when I'm battling some stuff. And I, and I wanted to share that with you. So last week we kicked it off. I talked about frustration. The title of our message last week was Fighting Frustration. Y'all remember that? Did I prophesy to anybody last week? Praise the Lord, because I don't know about you, but it's funny how when you preach something, then you got to live it out, uh, just some frustrations and stuff. Uh, but we looked at, at a story of Moses and the Israelites and um, how they showed up at a place that didn't look like what they thought they were, where they thought they were going, and, and we talked about that and talked about how to handle and manage and fight frustration. Today, I want to kind of go to the next step. I want to share with you uh, some things. I want to look today at three different occasions in the Bible where we see this actually come up. I want to talk to you about the subject that everybody on the planet, okay, whether you are saved or not, whether you are in church or not, whether you love the Lord or not, whether you think you're a, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Christian, a Muslim, an atheist, whatever, everybody on earth has dealt with this issue. Anybody want to know what it is? Okay, y'all just kind of looking at me like, you know, it's up to you, Pastor. We're good either way. I mean, you know, today I want to talk about the subject of temptation. Temptation. Has anybody ever been tempted by anything before? That's good. The rest of you, just tempted by lying maybe, possibly. Has anybody in here ever, have you ever like gone through this, this thing of temptation and felt like you failed miserably? Anybody? Anybody be transparent in here? Anybody ever gone through temptation? You're like, man, I knocked it out of the park like I did well. Anybody? A lot less hands. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk today about temptation because temptation is real. And temptation is a subject that uh, I think we really don't understand exactly how or why it's even a part of the journey that we have in this thing called life. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you as, as we talk about this. One of the things that I found very interesting in, in 10 years, 10 plus years of ministry, having so many conversations with people, uh, it, it doesn't take long because most of the time when people come and talk to me, uh, and, and, and they'll, they'll share with me some of the struggles they're going through. Almost, almost guaranteed at some point in the conversation, we're going to arrive to a place where we're talking about this thing that's kind of out there as uh, some type of temptation. So, so it's interesting, and, and, I, and it's really often misunderstood. I don't think we understand not only why we deal with it, but how to deal with it. And so, so we end up really kind of, kind of treating this thing like it's the plague, and that we've got to really, you know, this temptation thing, like we are scared to death of it. And especially if you grew up in any type of holiness situation. I know some of y'all grew up in churches maybe. And, uh, and, and, you know, anything that, you know, if it makes you green, it must be sin. Anybody ever been in one of those churches before? And so we're scared to death that we're going to get near too close to something, you know, that we're going to catch it. And so we got a, you know, temptation. You know, you say the word temptation and the fingers go up. Hallelujah. I don't know if that's a Catholic thing or I'm not sure if that's just a Hollywood thing. But we just... But temptation is real. Temptations are real. I mean, and, and we all have temptations. And, and, and I want to talk to you today because on, two, on two, different, two different levels. One, temptation is not always what you think it is. Temptation is not always little devil, little angel, and, you know, you're trying to decide which one to do. And, and, and I, want to, I want to talk today about this thing called temptation, but I want to start by laying a foundation of, of, of a, a very, I think, misunderstood principle when it comes to frustration. Almost always in those conversations I'm having with people, they'll say this, I want you to pray for me about this. I want you to pray that God would deliver me from this. God will not deliver you from temptation.
test. One, two, are we on? God won't deliver you from temptation. People say, well, I just want you. Man, that's just, I just wish they would deliver me. And, so, and, and, and oftentimes our prayers are for God to remove a temptation in our life. And I need to share with you why that's the truth. The reason God will not remove and deliver you from temptation is because if God removes the temptation, then you have no choice. And God has given us this thing called free will. And the only way your, your will could be free is if it can choose between one thing or another. And so we often ask God to remove something in our lives when really God is giving us the wisdom and the strength and courage to choose not to be a part of that thing. And so we ask God to remove it, and God says, I'm not going to remove that. You're, it's always going to be there. I need to help you out. God is not going to deliver you from your temptation. Well, I need scripture. Okay, I'll give you a scripture. Anybody ever heard of the Lord's Prayer? If not, Pastor Aaron's got a ring. You can get it and read it. The Lord's Prayer, you know what it says? Deliver us from evil, lead us not to temptation. We, gotta, we want to be delivered from temptation. Jesus never said he would deliver you from temptation. He said, I'll deliver you from evil. Now, you need to understand the difference between temptation and evil. Evil is sin. All right, sin would be, all right, let's use this example. Sin is lust, right? Right? Lust is a sin, Right? It's not a trick question, y'all. Y'all like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even sure what's a sin anymore. Hallelujah. I'll suck a few. All right, lust is a sin. Pornography is not a sin. Pornography is a temptation. The sin is lust. So while we, we ask God to deliver us from pornography, can I just tell y'all, God's probably not going on the internet today and shut down everything. There's always going to be that temptation out there because God says you need to choose me. Now, you, he chose you first, but he wants you to choose him back. Now, now I'm not saying we don't need to fight to, make, you know, to, to keep things holy. We don't need to, you know, we, we need to do our part, certainly, and we need to pray against those things and, and pull down those altars, absolutely. But what I'm trying to tell you is you will never completely remove all the temptation because the moment you do, you've just become a, a God robot. And, and, and God doesn't want that. That's not what God desires. God wants you to choose him. God wants you to say, okay, I can do this, but I'd rather do that. Now, the problem that we've got in church is, like we talked about a few weeks ago, don't play in the road. Stay away from that. Stay away from that. And we don't ever talk about the good things of God. And so, so, so I, want to, I want to challenge you today because I, I need you to understand that temp, you will not get delivered from temptation by coming to an altar and having hands laid on you. You can get delivered from sin that way. But that's not how you get delivered from temptation. All right? God's not going to deliver you from that. And I, I know some of y'all are already upset. Don't worry. I'm going to tell y'all, you want to know how to overcome temptation? Can, can I just say this? God, maybe God doesn't want to rescue from that thing because he wants you to change that thing. We, we, we want God to deliver us from everything. Like we just want, I mean, and that's just not how it works, y'all. God has given us empowerment by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us that has allowed us to say, and I need you to understand something. We've got this bad thing in church where we think having the Holy Spirit makes me better than somebody else. Having the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. Having the Holy Spirit makes me better than me. And so I don't have to believe God to deliver me from everything when God has given me the power to say no to some things. Now, now God, could, God, there is deliverance, but he delivers you from evil. He delivers you from sinful things. And, we, and that's important to understand. But today we're talking about temptation. We're talking about the choice. Because the truth of the matter is you will become frustrated in your prayer life because God won't remove. You know, wouldn't it have been nice if God would have just said, all right, Adam and Eve, y'all like what you see? They're like, yeah, man, this is nice. This has got it going on. It's a lot better than that resort Pastor Brad talked about. This is nice. He says, hey, we got all these trees. You can eat of any of these trees. And, stay. and then you got a couple of trees in the middle of the garden, right? The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what if, God, what if Adam would have said, ooh, and, and, and God said, don't, don't eat of that tree. And what if Adam would have said, oh, don't eat of that tree? He's like, no, don't eat of that tree. Okay, well, then take that tree away. That's what we're asking God to do. Take the tree away. God says, no, 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 the tree's going to be there. Just don't eat from it. And we're asking God to remove the tree. God's not removing the tree. Because if God removes the tree, listen, you will never choose good if you can't choose bad. You will never choose God if you can't choose no God. See, that's the thing. God says, I want you to choose. I'm giving you a free will. So if I remove the temptation, I've, I've taken away your ability to choose me over something else. Are you with me? 
So we got to settle that because praying for God to remove all the temptations is probably not going to happen. All right? God's not going to shut down the department store. Hey, Lord, I just went, every paycheck I got, Lord, have my right body put a new mannequin up with a new dress, and I just find myself in there swiping. So, Lord, remove that temptation. You want them to shut Belt Berry down. No, God, 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 that's not how God works. God doesn't shut down the department store. God gives you the strength to be able to look at it and say, you know what, not today, and I'm going to ride right on. Are you with me? I needed to touch it because some of y'all women were starting to think this was going to be a man, one of the man sermons. And I needed to make sure I made it real now. I want to look today at temptation. I want to look at three different characters of the Bible. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Judges. The book of Judges, the sixth chapter. I got to tell y'all the truth. I got so nervous. We were down in Greenville. And I'm the first speaker of the, of the conference. Is a guy named Pastor Darius Daniels, who I think is one of the top three preachers on the planet. And literally, Darius Daniels stands up and he says, turn to Judges 6. And I said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I started breaking out in a sweat. And I said, Lord, I got two issues. One, if this man preaches the sermon that I'm going to preach on Sunday, everybody, I, there's no way I can convince the 70 people that are, in, that are in from Kingdom Builders with me that I actually was going to do this before he did it. And number two, He's one of the best preachers I've ever, I love the man's ministry. And I was like, there ain't no way I'm going to preach as good as he is, so I'm just in a mess, God. Now, thankfully, God, he went a different direction. And I just hallelujah and praise the Lord. But uh, anyway, are you at Judges 6? I want to talk to you for a minute about a guy, a good friend of ours named Gideon, okay? Y'all know Gideon? Gideon was, had an army of 300, right? Went on to do great things, opened up a body shop right down 117, hallelujah. He, uh, Gideon was a, 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 a key character, especially in the book of Judges. But the introduction that we have to Gideon is less favorable than the victorious, triumphant story that we read about at the end of his life because Gideon didn't exactly start off with a bang. And in Judges chapter 6, we actually see God place a call on Gideon's life that Gideon is not so sure about. Now, I know there's nobody in here that has ever had a conversation with God and you felt like you were unavailable, unequipped, unqualified to do what God's called you to do. But will you just entertain me for a few moments as we talk about Gideon and pretend like maybe, just maybe somewhere along the line, you felt like God was asking you to do something and you were like, God, you have got, you've got to be kidding me, all right? But that's Gideon. So look at our, let's look at, let's start with verse 11. I want to read, I don't know, about five or six verses here, and then we'll move on. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah. I didn't know Oprah was that old. I mean, I knew she'd been around, but. Which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon responded, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? I know you've never cried out that before. And where are all his miracles that Pastor Brad told us about? Saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Lord, why was it? You brought me out of that last thing, and now here I am, left to die in this new thing. Why is it that you, and you took me out of that last job that I didn't like and gave me this new job, and now I'm being laid off? Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Before you get settled, I want you to stand your feet for just a moment. I want you to high-five three people and just tell them, It's time to tame temptation.
I want to give you just a little bit of context of this passage before we uh, dive into it so we can move on. Um, the Israelites here are in fear and in bondage to the Midianites. And what would happen is the Midianites would show up at the Israel camp and after harvest time, they would show up with their weapons and their threats and their big dog barks. And they would say, all right, give us what you brought in. Give us the harvest that you just received. And the Midianites were basically the bully. Give me your lunch money, okay? And the Israelites, who were weaker people at the time, who weren't sure of the promises of God because they had been in this season of frustration, they would act accordingly to the Midianites and they would give them their harvest and let the Midianites have their way with it. And so Gideon, knowing that the Midianites show up during harvest time, knowing that whenever they do show up, all of what he has gleaned that is good will be taken from him and given to the enemy camp, he decides he's going to hide out in the basement where the wine cellar is, and go down and thresh the wheat down there so if the Midianites happen to come while he's threshing, they won't know about his hidden stash. I know y'all are Christians. Y'all don't know what hidden stash means. <laughs> but that's what Gideon's doing. He's hiding out in the wine. You know, it's interesting because he's threshing, and if you understand the actual process of threshing, what would happen is they would take the wheat and the tares. So that threshing is a separation of the wheat and the tares, and they would literally toss it into the air, and the wind would come through, and the wind would separate the, the, the uh, wheat from the tares, from the shafts. But Gideon is in a basement. I don't know if you've ever been in a basement, but I've never been in a basement where there was wind. So I'm just assuming Gideon's down there tossing it up, <laughs> making his own wind, trying to make sure he separates the wheat from the tares. And, and he's hiding out from the Midianites, not only because he's scared, but also because he's strategic. Because he doesn't want the enemy to get hold of what's his. You know what I found? There are a lot of us. We get gifts from God. And it's really not a matter of whether or not we receive. It's really a matter of whether or not we keep. You know, the woman with the issue of blood that touched the hem of Jesus' garment, it wasn't that she needed something she didn't have. It's that she couldn't keep what she got. In other words, she was losing, but she didn't need a blood transfusion. She needed to stop hemorrhaging what she was losing. And I need to help some of y'all because some of y'all are asking God to increase your finances. But it's not that God needs to increase and give you more. It's that God needs to stop the hemorrhaging where you're losing what you got. And Gideon is hiding out in the basement, minding his own business, literally, hiding from the enemy, trying to keep what little bit God has given him. I'm amazed at how often we as believers in Christ, we as children of God, are so much on the defensive. We're trying to protect what we got. So we're not willing to risk what we have to get what we don't have. Let me just say it like this. Churches are content if they can just keep who they got. They don't have to have an increase. I don't care if anybody else gets saved as long as we don't let the devil in here. And, and, and that's Gideon's mindset. Gideon's hiding out, making sure that the enemy doesn't get was, was his. But the Lord sends an angel to Gideon who shows up, and in verse 12 he says, The Lord is with you, Gideon, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. I'm hiding, in case you didn't realize it. I'm scared to death, chilling down here, minding my own business. And Gideon's like, that's not me. That's, you got the wrong person. But the angel of the Lord says, you, you mighty man of valor. I'll never forget when I was nine years old. I was playing basketball in my backyard. I had some friends over. and had a dear friend from our, our church, church I grew up in, and he stopped by on that Saturday morning. And we were out there playing. And I'll never forget, I didn't realize he had pulled up. And uh, 
Man, I don't know if I should tell this story. My mama's going to be mad, but I'm going to tell it anyway. And, uh, and, and a friend of mine went up for a shot, and I blocked the shot. And when I blocked it, I blocked it. I, it was one of them nasty, just nasty blocks. Like LeBron just. And when I did, I cussed at him. Like, give me that stuff. And I turned around, and this man from my church is standing in my driveway. A man named Bill Rand. And my friend, one of my friends says, hey, there's somebody here. And I turned around, I was like, mm. Well, he was older. Maybe he didn't hear it. Hallelujah. So I, walk, I remember walking over to him, asking him what he was looking for. And he, I said, Mom and Dad are actually out of town. They're, they're at a convention. And, um, and he was standing there, and he said, I didn't come to talk to your mom and dad. I wanted to speak to you for a minute. And I'm like, man, come on, man. This is not. You can see me at church. I'm hanging out with my guys. And I'll never forget, he said, boy, you're called to preach. I'm nine years old. I was in the fourth grade, and I remember thinking, man, wrong number. I remember when we decided we were going to start a church and <clears throat> in the process we planned for six months before we had our launch date and I was attending another church, um, church that was led by a gentleman named Apostle Leroy Washington. And I remember showing up to his church one Sunday morning and I didn't know him. I'd met his wife several times, precious woman of God. I still consider her mother in the faith to me today and Miss Lila and we, I went and showed up, and I'd never met her husband. I'd heard her preach, but I'd never been there. They have a church in Virginia too, and he would be, they would alternate weeks. So every time I'd been, she was preaching, and I got there, and so he says, so after service, he looks at me and said, "You're called to preach." And once again, I, we were planting a church, but I was not going to preach. I was going to run operations. I didn't have any desire to do this. And I was like, nah. I said, wrong, wrong person. I'm like, she told him about the other guy. And he's got us confused. I was like, nah, that's, that's not me. And he, and he said, no, it's you. And, I, and this is exactly, I said, I've never been to seminary. He said, well, you better get ready to go. Never forget that. And I remember sitting there and looking back on when I was nine years old and when I was 29 years old, I remember thinking both times as I reflect back on it, God, you've, you've got the wrong person. You've got the wrong, I don't know if you've ever had that conversation with God where you feel like when God asks you to do something, you're thinking, no, nah, there's no way. Like you, you really have missed the mark this time, God. But, but, but you know, it's funny because God will call things out of you that you don't even know are in there. And that's really what's happening to Gideon, y'all. He's hiding out, threshing wheat in the wine press, hiding from the enemy. And God shows up and says, the enemy that you're hiding from is the one you're going to lead my army in defeat. Now, I can only imagine, if you know the story of Gideon, he decided, he finally gets the word of God, and he decides he's going he's gonna to roll with this thing. And he does it, and he's successful, and he builds this big army. And he builds this giant army getting ready to take on the Midianites. And God looks at him and says, you got too many. And so he cuts it down, like 10,000. And then God says, oh, yeah, now you good? You got it? You got it? Where you want to? He's like, well, I'd be a lot happier. You know, we're outnumbered four to one already, but I'm good. He's like, all right, now you still got too many. And he cuts it down to 300. And God is tired. And I'm so glad. Like, I'm thinking if God would have told Gideon on the threshing floor, hey, Gideon, you're going to defeat the Midianites, and you're only going to do it with 300 people. I'm thinking Gideon, not only is he going to say wrong number, He's going to go, I can't hear you. There's a bad connection. But see, that's how God does, y'all. God won't show you the entire story. He'll just show you the parts you need to know to position you to where you need to get to be. And, and I want to deal with this because Gideon is freaking out. And God shows up and says, you are a mighty man of valor. I want you to write this down. There's three points I want to give you so you can begin to recognize what temptation looks like because temptation isn't always what it seems. Temptation is not, a, can I just help you out? Temptation isn't always the devil trying to get you to sin like you think it is. Let me make it real for you. In Luke 4, 
when Jesus shows up, he gets baptized. The Bible says the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. Not a trick question. To be tempted. Okay. Satan tempts him. Do you realize that not one time did Satan tempt him with one of the sins that comes to your mind when you think of sin? Like, I'm, if I'm writing the story, I'm probably like, all right, here's Satan. And Satan's like, all right, Jesus. This is how we would write it in church today. We'd be like, so he tempted Jesus, and Jesus sitting there, so he let this nice blonde walk by. 36, 24, 36. Huh? Sweet lips, big hips. But Jesus said no. But Satan didn't tempt Jesus like you think Satan always tempts you. Because we always think Satan's either trying to get you to kill somebody, cuss at somebody, sleep with somebody, or put something in your body that's not of God. But the temptation of Satan is far beyond just the big ten. See, Satan's trying to get you to do anything you can that's not of God. Because you can do God and it's always good, but you can do good and it ain't always God. And you know what? I, there are many believers who've fallen trapped to temptation and they're doing good, but they're not doing God. And so we settle for doing stuff that appears to be good. And we go to church and we put money in an offering plate and we go to Sunday school or we go to life group and we serve in the church, but we never come to a fullness of understanding that God has a greater purpose. Why? Because we settled for the temptation of doing good instead of doing God. Gideon is not tempted with evil sin like we think it is. Gideon is tempted with this thing called insecurity. When he tempted Jesus in the garden, he never said, sleep with her, drink this, say that. That's not what he said. What did he say? Just worship. Hey, I know you're hungry. Turn the stone into bread. You know, it's amazing. Everything he tempts Jesus with is stuff Jesus is going to do in the future. See, Jesus turned the stone, the law, into the bread of life. And he's like, why don't you do this? Like we, think he, we always think he's like, hey, why don't you stick a heroin needle in your arm? And you know what? He does do that sometimes. But the problem is we've associated everything that's bad in culture to everything that's not God. And there's so much good in culture that's not God. And let me help you out. Let me just get, let me make it real for you. All right. Yep. May upset you, but it's all right. The Salvation Army does good stuff. But if you're tithing to the Salvation Army, you're not doing God. And it's good, but it's not God. And so we'll, we'll remove ourselves from the will of God doing things that appear to be good. And we'll go, well, I'm never going to step foot in there. Be careful where you tell God you'll never step foot in. Be careful when you start telling God what you will and will not do. Because I told God, I'm going to be honest, I told y'all, when we started church, I said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll even preach. I don't want to preach, but I'll preach. But I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going overseas. Whatever we need to do, we can do right here. I went, I went full-fledged Christian on them. I was like, there's people in our community that need Jesus. We don't have to go across the sea. And you know, you know what, you know what the Lord did? The Lord took me to Thailand. And I was like, are you kidding me? I don't I didn't I couldn't have pointed Thailand to you on a map. I couldn't have found Thailand on Map Quest. <laughs> you gotta be careful when you tell God what you will or won't do. And oftentimes we think we're doing the will of God because it's good. And Gideon ain't doing anything wrong. He's just not doing not fulfilling purpose. So here's what I want you to write with your first point, because this is what temptation does. I gotta move quick. Here we go. These are gonna be three short points. Temptation will attempt to get you to forfeit your identity in order to feed your insecurity. You will forfeit your identity to feed your insecurity. Can I help you out with something? Temptation, the purpose of temptation is to get you to question who you are. You know, in Luke 4, when Jesus is having this conversation with the devil, you know how the devil starts out each time? If you are the son of man, do this. So you need to understand something. Every time the enemy's trying to get you to do something, it's because he's trying to prove that you aren't something. My 
God, that's a, that's a revelation. And so he tells Jesus, do these things, but the reason I want you to do these things is so you'll try to prove that you are what you say you are. And so, cause, cause, and the reason he does this is because if he can get us to question our identity, do you know what your identity is? Do you know who you are? You're a child of God. You're a child of God. That's who you are. You're not your name. You're not your driver's license number. You're not your mom and daddy's boy or girl. You are a child of God. That's who you are. Because the creator gets to determine the identity. And so you are a child of God. You are not a young black man. You're a child of God. You are not a stunningly beautiful white woman. You're a child of God. You're not a, you're a child of God. You're not a pastor. You're a child of God. You're not a singer. That's not who you are. You're not an elder. You're not a husband. You're not a wife. You're not a father. You're a mother. Those are roles. That's not your identity. That's why pastors, when they retire, don't know who they are because they've been a pastor for 45 years. And so we got people who are 99 years old preaching, and they don't need to be preaching. They can't even remember the first line. They just keep going over the same point. If I'm preaching when I'm 99, shoot me. <laughs> Full permission. Take me out back like an old mule. I'm sorry, I'm just being honest. You know why? I'm calling, I'm talking to us, I'm talking to leaders. You know why? Because we have learned that our role is our identity, and that's not right. That's not who you are. And the reason there's an identity crisis in the body of Christ is because every one of us begins to define who we are by our role. The problem is when your role changes, you don't know who you are. And so you were a husband, but she left you. Now you don't know who you are. No, you never changed who you are. Because you were never a husband to begin with. That's a role you played. That's something you were fulfilling. So you don't lose you're a child of God before you were anything else. I mean, if I never preach another sermon, I will never change who I am. Because I'm a child of God. If I never, if I, if I turn in a resignation tomorrow, don't clap, and never pastor again, I'm still a child of God. And what the enemy wants you to think is, if he can get you to do something, then you'll begin to question if you are something. So if you are this, prove it to me. And I need to help y'all out, because God is not in the proving business. I know you think, well, God has to test us to know if we're right. God don't have to test you. God don't need to learn anything. God knows everything about you before you even know it. So you don't have to prove. You need to prove your love for God. You don't prove your love for God? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. What are you going to prove to God? What do you know that God doesn't? <laughs> but we, we begin to, to think that, hey, if I do this, then I'll, I'll prove, you know, and the truth of the matter is we're not trying to prove it to God, we're trying to prove it to us. And so the enemy's like, oh, if you are this, won't you do this? And so what happens is we get moved from that. The whole purpose of temptation is to get you to question. Because if I question my identity, I question my relationship. Let me help you out. You need to write this down. If you ain't writing nothing else down, you need to tweet this or whatever you need to do. Take a picture, paint it, whatever you need to do. What if temptation, because you know what we think temptation is? We think temptation is a test of our self-control. That's what we've made it, right? So temptation is, can I refrain from taking a drink to prove that I'm in control of myself? Because we know the Bible says that he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. So self-control is a fruit of the spirit. Nothing wrong with self-control. But what if temptation isn't to prove my self-control? What if temptation is to prove my relationship? So, so the purpose of temptation is not to get me to prove that I'm stronger than this thing that I'm tempted with. What if it's to prove to me, test me to see if I'm really in relationship with him? That's what temptation does. It tests your relationship. That's what it did with Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I want to see how much you really think he's your father. If you are his son, do this. Can I tell you all this? When he tempted Jesus, he wasn't tempting Jesus' will. He was tempting Jesus' relationship. Now, let me help you out. Because when you pass the test, you don't get credit. 
If temptation is a test of your self-control, then when you do it, who gets the glory? Well, if temptation is really a test of my dependence on him, now who gets the glory? You ain't never heard that before. I ain't never, it ain't in my notes. That's good though. Write that down in case I miss it. I ain't got it. But that's what temptation's about. It's to test our relationships with him. That's what he did with Jesus. If you are his son, then do this. And Jesus like, no, I, 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 I'm, not here. I'm not hearing this. Because I know this. I don't need to prove myself to you to prove myself to me to prove myself to him. I'm his child whether I turn stones into bread or not. I'm his child whether I throw myself off this cliff or not. I'm his child and I won't never worship you. Right? So temptation will get you. And see, I, the enemy loves insecurity. Have you ever noticed that the enemy always attacks the area where you feel the weakest? You ever notice that? Why doesn't the enemy ever attack your strength? Because he's smarter than that. So the enemy will always go after the area in your life where you feel like you're the most insufficient. And insecurity is a monster. It is. It is. And I, I deal with, every, there's not a Sunday that I walk in here that I don't have to deal with insecurity. And you'd be amazed. You'd probably, because I think, so I've had people tell me, like, you look like you're having so much fun up there. And I do, man, I love this. Y'all make it fun. I don't like preaching everywhere. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I preach some places I won't never go back. So it ain't the preaching, it's the people. I'm being honest. I ain't even trying to be funny. I'm being honest. Y'all just laughing. I don't know what y'all laughing at. Teach y'all to laugh at me. I'm going to talk about y'all in a minute. But you know what, man? I sit there at midnight on Saturday night when I'm going over my notes one last time and I, and I read it, and, and the more I read it, the worse the sermon gets. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, is this going to bless anybody? Like, is this going to help anybody? What, what kind of people is this sermon going to produce? And I, I'm just so insecure about it. Can I just be honest with y'all? Is it all right? So some of y'all looking like, oh, my God, what is going on? Like, I don't need an exorcism. I'm just being honest with you. And, 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 and honestly, I, I mean, I, I get to, I, I'll just start to feel like, oh, my, you know, am I, Lord, I, I, not, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. I mean, I'll think of every reason not to do it. And I realize that's exactly where the enemy operates, in that insecurity. Because if he can convince you that you're not what you say you are, so you know what I say every every time I start to hear it? Because I don't, do y'all ever have the little voices? Anybody ever had the conversations? Anybody? Anybody ever have conversations? You know what I'm talking about, right? The little bubble conversations? Everybody call them bubble conversations. You ever text somebody? You know, you're texting, they got little bubbles to pop up. And you text in the blue bubble, and they text this gray bubble, and you text, and then you see the dot, dot, dot. And you waiting, and you waiting, and you waiting. And you don't know if they just accidentally hit a button or if they're really typing something really long, so you waiting. But you know, you know, sometimes it's, I see the bubbles in my head and I see me and I see the enemy. And I have, to, I have to constantly choose not to believe what the gray bubble says. And some of y'all think it's weird when you talk to yourself, but if some of y'all would talk to yourself, you'd be a lot less weird. But, but it's this insecurity, it's like... I, and, and, you know, the, the, the enemy's so good at it because he knows, he, you know, the, the, the conversation always ends with this. You know what? You know what? You know what you did. You're going to, you really, you're going to preach that? You know what you, you're going to preach on insecurity? Do you, you know how insecure you are. You're going to preach on frustration and you know how many words you said that are not found in the King James Bible <laughs> when you couldn't find your keys last week. And you got, really, you want to do a marriage conference? Are you kidding me? You want to talk about leadership? You're going to preach on what? You know what you did. You know who you are. You know what? You ever had that? You know, you know, you know. And see, that's the, that's the voice of insecurity. That's how the enemy tempts us. And what he's doing is he's trying to get you to question. He, what he wants you to do is he's getting the focus on you so that you'll lose your focus on him. So he attacks you because he thinks if I can just keep poking you right there, then you'll focus on right there. 
And that's what temptation does. Temptation is not to get you to go drink a 12-pack. Temptation is to get you removed from remembering who you are in Christ. Because when I go drink the 12-pack when I know I shouldn't, it's not because I got tempted by the 12-pack. It's because I forgot for a moment that I'm a child of God. Every failure you've ever gone through is because you didn't remember in that moment who you were. You know, I don't know anybody that just wakes up one day and says, I really want to go cheat on my spouse. I don't, I don't know anybody that wakes up one day. But you know what happens is, is the insecurity. It's the insecurity. And so the enemy goes, she didn't tell you. She, when's the last time your wife told you you look good in jeans? Like my wife just happy that I got clean jeans. Like she's just happy if they get washed. But when, when's, when's the last time he told you that he loved you? Because you remember, you know, so-and-so at work always tells you you look nice on Monday mornings. See, you think the temptation is the affair. The temptation is trying to get you removed from who you really are. Now, I'm a child of God, and he's blessed me. And when a man finds a good woman, he's found a good thing. See, what happens is, though, I get removed from her. I forget who I am, so I begin to act like who I'm not. Is this helping anybody? And it's all rooted in insecurity. So temptation, we see the last temptation. Whether or not I need to have a meeting with somebody that's not my husband or wife. That, that's the fruit of something that happened way back here. The temptation is getting me to think that my marriage is not what it's supposed to be. Or that they don't treat me like I should be treated. Or I'm not who I said I am. And we want to go over here and deal with all the fruit. I can't believe they did it. The reason they did it is because they lost their mind. They had the mind of Christ and they forgot who they were. Yes. That's good. That's good, and it's rooted in insecurity because what happens is when I'm insecure about who God made me, I'll act like who I think I should be. And, and I, I'll tell you, can I be... Pastors are probably the most insecure people on the planet. Because I don't know any other profession where you go sit across the table and tell me how much you how much struggle you got, and then I got to stand up and preach a sermon that's gonna help people. Most of them have the same struggle you do, and every time I preach it, you think I'm preaching because of what you shared with me. Do you know, not, not one time in 11 years have I sat down and said, oh yeah, well so-and-so told me they're struggling, so I'm gonna preach a sermon to them. Can I just help you out? Y'all ain't that important. <laughs> now, now and, and people will say, see, it's funny because people say, you were preaching to me, Pastor. And I'm like, no, I was just preaching. You just happened to hear it and listen to it. Like, you need, if, if I was preaching to you, you better take that up with him because I'm just trying to preach what he put in my heart. And so we're insecure because we think we're everything we say. That's why I've been set free from that. That's why I say too much. And see, you know what? It's, it, there's insecurity in that. There's insecurity in that. And so I had people around me. Did I say something? And I, well, you kind of crossed the line a little bit. Well, I'm sorry. But I mean, honestly, I just can't. It ain't just my wife. It's a bunch of people. I mean, I've, we're the only church I've ever been in that talks about race. I've never been in a church anywhere that talks about race. And, and, and you know, the bad thing is, is most of the time the things that we won't talk about are the things we struggle with the most. So we got to deal with this thing because I'm not going to lead an insecure church because I know who this church is supposed to be. I am more, can I just say this, and this may not be right, Brother John, I'm in the council after this, um, but I, I don't know where all this is coming from, but I just need to share some things. I'm more, I'm more secure in who our church is than who your pastor is. Insecurity will rob you of your identity. It'll cause you to forfeit and forget who you really are because it'll have you question everything that you aren't. And that's where Gideon's at. When, when the angel of the Lord shows up and says, mighty man of God, he's speaking to his identity. Yeah, but I don't feel like a mighty man of God. I don't care how you feel. Your feelings don't change your identity. 
So he speaks to his identity. But the insecurity tries to rob him of who his identity really is. Because if I can get you to think that you're really just a sorry little joker hiding out from the enemy, then you'll never really step into the fullness of who you are to lead an army to take care of the enemy. <sighs> Temptation will get you to forfeit your identity to feed your insecurity. All right, number two. Second Samuel 11. I can move quick on these two. Praise the Lord. Um, Second Samuel chapter 11. I'm not even going to read this. I'm going to just talk about it for a second. Because you know this. Because this has been preached at every men's conference and marriage retreat. And King David is hanging out at the crib one day. He decides to go up on the top floor of the palace to look at all the great things he has done. While he's up there, he sees Sheba taking a bath. Bath, Sheba. <laughs> you, he sees somebody he sh shouldn't see. And it appeals to him. So he sends his men to go get Bathsheba and bring him to his quarters. Where he sleeps with Bathsheba. And then he finds out later that Bathsheba is actually the wife of one of his men. In the army. Bathsheba calls him up. Hey, boo. <laughs> Got something to tell you. I'm with child. That's what we say in the Bible. I'm pregnant. Are you kidding me? <sighs> really? What are we going to do? I tell you what, uh, he sends for her husband to be brought back off the battlefield so he can sleep with his wife so that nine months later, oh boy's a soldier, he ain't a mathematician. The baby going to show up and he's just going to assume it's his. Shows up and says, no, I'm not sleeping with my wife while I have men out there fighting. David's like, no, really, you really ought to. And the guy's like, no, I'm not going to. David's like, I'm the king, you really ought to. He's like, I'm not going to do it, I don't care. I'm not going to dishonor my men. David's like, okay, fine, go. Go back to the battlefield. So David's like, all right, there's only one thing left to do. We're going on Mari. And the test has revealed you are the father. So he actually sends, his, sends her husband out on the front line, has him killed. And we preach this thing, and oh yeah, you can't preach temptation without preaching this pastor's scripture because there's that temptation of lust, pastor. And you know what? There's a lot to say about that, and that's been hashed and rehashed and rehashed. I don't need to talk about that, but I want to point, point your attention to one little phrase that occurs in the first verse of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. It says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. He saw the woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. David sees her taking a shower. But here's the thing. David should have never been where David was. Because in verse 1 it says it was the spring of the year, the time and season where kings are out to battle. I need to talk to you for a minute because the temptation that David had is not the temptation you're thinking about. That was the fruit of the other. See, what, what you need to understand if you, if you look at the context and go back and read 2 Samuel first, uh, chapter 10, what you'll find is David and his entourage, his army, have just come off two major battles. That first they defeated King Ammon and the Ammonites, and then they went on, they had this issue going on with the Syrians, so they beat the Syrians, so they just conquered two major victories. And now it's time to go out and take more territory. But David has become intoxicated with his own success. And here's the temptation that we have oftentimes. The temptation for David to sleep with Bathsheba is just a, simply a fruit of the fact that he was sitting somewhere where he shouldn't have been. And the reason he was somewhere where he shouldn't have been is because he gave in the temptation of success. You know what I'm amazed about, Brother Milton? Most of us are so afraid of failure, but I've found that success is a bigger tiger to tame. 
Because David has just experienced great success. The problem is when we, experience, when we experience great success is this thing called pride sets in. And so now David is so prideful in what he's built that he says it can run itself. I don't even have to go out on the battlefield. But I need to help some of y'all because you need to understand this. Some of the battles God sends you to is not because God needs you for the battle. It's because God needs the battle for you. See, the battle, it wasn't that God needed David to beat the other armies because God didn't need David. God could do it all by himself. But the reason God wanted David out on that battlefield is so God, David wouldn't end up somewhere where he shouldn't. See, sometimes the battles have been created for you to keep you out of battles that you can't win. See, David was a man of war. David had no issue fighting on the battlefield. The problem was when David wasn't fighting, he wasn't focused. And I need you to take this down because here's point two because this is what temptation does. Temptation will get you to forfeit your purpose in order to feed your pleasure. And the pleasure that David fed was not just the pleasure of his flesh because he saw a good-looking woman. It was that he gave in to the temptation of feeding his pleasure of enjoying the success that he had come to. And David was a man of war, y'all. David was, a man, David was such a man of war that when he went to God and said, I want to build your house, God said, no, you're a man of war. He said, you're a man of blood. You're a man, you're a man that's taking That's not your job. Oh, I need to speak to this for just a second because some of y'all need to understand this. David wanted to do something for God, and God said, you're not qualified to do it. But here's what you need to understand. The reason David was disqualified was not because he'd had an affair with Bathsheba. The reason he was disqualified is because what he wanted to do was not attached to his purpose. The only thing that disqualifies you from doing something for God is when it's not attached to the purpose that God's put in your heart. I am preaching this thing. And so what happens is we think we're disqualified because of something we did. No, you're disqualified from God using you because that's not the area where God wants to use you in. And you're mad because I don't understand, God. I'm trying to do this for you, God. Why won't you let me be a pastor? Why won't let you be, 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 be a preacher? Why won't you let me sing a solo? I don't understand, God. That's not where God wants you. Your assignment is determined by your purpose, and your purpose is not discovered. It's not designed by you. It's discovered by you. And the problem David had, it wasn't a lust issue. That was that that came later. It was pride. It was pride. The temptation that he gave into was the temptation to enjoy and become so intoxicated by what he had done that he forgot who he was. You're a man of war, David. Can I help some of y'all out? One of the greatest ways to avoid the pitfall is to stay on the path. When you remember your purpose and you walk according to your purpose, then you'll avoid the pitfalls of that success sometimes bring you. Because what happens is we're walking down the path and we get so good at walking down the path, we put it on autopilot. David has built such an army, he's become such a mighty man of war that he's like, it doesn't even need me. It doesn't need you, but you need it. So we'll, forget, we'll forfeit our purpose in order to fulfill our pleasure. I want to end with this because there's a story in Genesis that I've preached up and down and front and back about two guys named Jacob and Esau. And y'all know the story, right? Twins. Roommates for nine months. Some of y'all get that on the way home. Time comes for them to get evicted out of their apartment. Esau starts to be birthed first. Jacob is trying his best to become the firstborn. Esau's firstborn. In the Hebrew culture, the firstborn would receive the birthright. So the birthright was Esau's, meaning he would get a double portion of the inheritance. Jacob grew up and knew this. Jacob wanted the birthright. One day Esau is out hunting because he's a hunter. And he comes in from hunting. must have been unsuccessful because he was starving. Jacob's hanging out in the kitchen because he's a mama's boy. All of you cooks, don't hate on me. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Esau walks in frustrated. Because he hadn't seen success. And we talked about it last week. Frustration will cause you not to think clearly. He frustrated. 
He shows up. He's starving. He goes, what's that smell? Jacob says, oh, I just got a Campbell's Chunky going. Some, he didn't say porridge. Nobody wants porridge. He's like, I got some soup and a PBJ with your name on it. He's stirring the pot in more ways than one. And Esau says, hey, let me have some of that, man. I'm starving. Jacob says, okay, one condition. I'll give you this whole pot if you'll just give me your birthright. I wonder how many people have given up their birthright for pot. I'm saying. And he says, he says, uh, okay. He thought about that thing. He thought about that thing some more, and he says, okay. So he does. He gives up his birthright. And it says, after he did it, he ate the bowl of soup, and it literally says he despised his birthright. Because you know what I found? You, you will end up hating what you lose. That's deeper than you think it is. And so he gives it up. He was tempted by a temporary condition to give up his eternal position. Third thing I want to share with you, this, this is the third point and last point. We'll get ready to go home. Third point is temptation will attempt to get you to forfeit your calling for the sake of convenience. It seems absolutely ridiculous to us that this man would give up all that he had for a bowl of soup. Makes no sense. There's no, I don't even like soup. But if I did, I still ain't giving up for it. He gave up everything. But you need to understand, when you are in a season of frustration, what you don't have is highlighted. And you'll forfeit what you don't have yet to get what you can have now. He was going to be twice as rich as his brother. I know, you know what, I, see, Esau ain't much of a bargainer. Because I'd have been like, I tell you what, bro, there's a day coming soon where I'm going to have twice as much as you. Now, I need you to slip me a little bit of soup or you're going to regret it later. <laughs> but he gives it all up. He forfeits his calling for the sake of convenience. But how many of us do that? How many of us are willing to let go of what we want one day in order to have a little something today? Because you know what I found? I'm probably the worst example in the world at delayed gratification. I don't even like, everything I order online is next day. Because I can't wait. I'm impatient. Shh. I'm impatient. She, amen. She about to throw an offering up here. I ain't never in my life. I am impatient. But I'm telling you right now, I will not give up what God has promised me tomorrow for something that he has not promised me today. And I'm not going to jeopardize my position because of my condition. And Esau forfeits what he's got coming to him to get something that's not even nearly as valuable as what he's about to receive. And that's what temptation does. It gets you to settle for good instead of receiving God. I want to ask you. I want to ask you. I need to ask. I need to ask you. Some of y'all waiting. Some of y'all waiting. Some of y'all waiting. Some of y'all like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm tired of waiting. I'm, I know you keep saying Boaz is showing up, but Boaz ain't showing up. And I'm about to settle for his cousin, and I'm not going to go there. Same last name, different first name. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Temptation. But you have, you have, you have to be willing to understand that God's timing is perfect. His timing is perfect. And I can't, when I, when I give in the temptation for taking now instead of what's next, here's what I do. I'm really saying I don't trust him enough to provide my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Can I help some of you out? You're not going to miss your window. 
I need, I need, I need you here. You're not going to miss your window. You're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. If you will just stay focused on him, you won't miss your window. You're not going to wake up one day and go, oh, I'm in, Lord, I've been waiting on you. No, no, no. The Lord is going to show you, and he's going to open up the windows of heaven for you. But you're scared you're going to miss it because you've been told things that sound real cliche. It's like you have to seize the opportunity. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to get your blessing. You, nobody's going to get your blessing. The favor that God's put on your life is not for you to get what somebody else is, for you to get what's yours. All right? I need you to catch that. All right? You're not going to miss out God. All right? So don't forfeit your calling in order to receive convenience. Stand to your feet. I want to close with this. Because I just showed y'all how to recognize temptation. Like in so many different ways, but I need I need you to catch this because what I hadn't shared with you is how to overcome it. Do you want to know how to overcome it right quick? It's a one, one scripture. That's all I got, one scripture. That's the only thing I can help you with is one scripture. I've told you all that to bring you to one scripture because about three years ago, I came across this scripture and it relieved me from five years of fighting. Because eight years ago, I struggled with a temptation, temptation of pornography. I didn't know what to do, so I did what every crazy person that has no idea what they're doing does, talks to his wife about it. And I don't know where you're at in your relationship, and you may not be at a place where you feel like you can tell your spouse if you're dealing with something like that. And I'm not, I'm not an advocate. I'm telling you what I did. My wife looked at me, and she said, well, We'll fight it. We'll fight it. I didn't know why. It made no sense. See, here's what you got to understand about temptation doesn't make sense when you first see it. I was married, happily married, to the most beautiful woman I've ever laid eyes on. Kids starting a ministry, and I'm struggling with something that I've never struggled with before. And I'm sitting there thinking, God, what is this? I don't understand this temptation. I don't, I don't, this doesn't make sense. I, I didn't know what to do. And so she came alongside and we began to fight it. And for five years, it worked. But it was a struggle. And I'd love to tell you that I had this revelation. And but one day I'm reading my Bible. And I'm reading the book of John, John 14, verse 15. Guys, you throw it up on the screen for me. John 14, verse 15. And it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I thought to myself, well, God, you know I love you. But man, these commandment things. Like, I ain't killed nobody. I ain't had adultery, committed adultery, but... That whole thing you said about if it's in your heart, you've done it. And I'm like, come on now, God. And the Lord said, read the verse. And I said, I did, God. If you love me, keep my commandments. And God said, you're not reading it the right way. And I said, I don't know how else to read it, God. Because what it says is, if I love you, then I'll prove it to you by keeping your commandments. And God said, no, you've missed it. And I was like, I missed what? God said, go look at the original text. And I did. And let me tell you what the original text is. It says, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. And I said, what's the difference, God? And God said, there's a comma there. If you love me, comma, then you'll keep my commandments. And I would read it over and over again. And I'm literally, I know y'all think I'm crazy, but I'm having this conversation with God. I'm like, God, I really don't know what you mean. And I, God didn't say this was temptation. He just said, you need to see this. You need to see this. You need to see this. And then I called it. And he said, it's two separate statements. And he said, the problem is you're living on the wrong side of the comma. He says, you think that if you keep my commandments... That proves that you love me. He said, the problem is you're so worried about keeping the commandments. He said, but if you'll just see it like this, if you'll just love me, then keeping the commandments 
I need, I need you to understand something. Look, keeping the commandments is not a requirement. It's a result. So he said, if you focus on loving me, then you'll keep the commandments. You don't have to worry about it. You'll keep them. Why? Because you love me. Stop focusing on what not to do and what to do. And just focus on loving me. And so I said, as I was thinking about this whole cycle that I'm in, and I was thinking about temptation, I was like, you know what? The key to overcoming temptation is not to figure out how to beat the temptation. It's to focus on loving Him. And I know, I know, well, that sounds good, Pastor, but how's that really going to help me? Like, how do I focus? Let me, all right, let me help you out. Guys, if you're struggling with pornography, God's not going to deliver you from pornography. He'll deliver you from lust because lust is a sin. But that pornography, that temptation is always going to be there. HBO ain't going out of business. Skinamax ain't going off there. But here's what happens. Next time you start to feel the temptation of pornography, start to worship Jesus. Can I help you out? Nothing will kill your mood. Like how great is my God. That's not, not a trick. It's not a trick. It's a truth. Because when I focus on God and the goodness of Him, and I focus my love on Him, and God, I'm not trying to love you by doing this. I'm going to focus on loving you, and this will happen. This will be an effect of my love for you. And I'm going to be honest with you. If the church catches this revelation, it changes the game. Because we don't have to convince people what to do or what not to do. We just teach them to love Jesus. And then what they do will line up with their love for Jesus. Because that's the cause and that's the effect. Can I do something right quick? If you've got, don't think when I say this, this is not a sermon on pornography. Everybody is going through stuff with temptations. If you have a temptation of any kind, nobody's going to judge you. Nobody knows what it is, but if you've got a temptation of any kind, I want you to just come down here right quick. Come real quick. Don't everybody, don't leave yet, I promise. we got two minutes, we're going to be out of here. Just come down here right quick if you've got a temptation that you want God to deal with, help you. Temptation of any kind. Real quick, real quick, real quick. Come on, we're going to get out of here. We're going to lunch, come on. All right, all right, all right, all right. Listen, here's what, here's what I'm going to help you with. You're going to pray, and God's going to deliver you from any evil that's come against you. There's no shame in deliverance, because deliverance isn't based on who you are. You're not a filthy person. you got a filthy spirit that's come upon you. And that may be in lust. It may be in pride. It may be in whatever. I'm going to be honest. The, the, there ain't a person in the world that don't struggle with gossip and other stuff. So, so we're going to pray for God to deliver you from that. But here's what we're going to do. You're going to ask God to strengthen you so that you can choose not to give in the temptation. The Bible doesn't say fight the temptation and it'll leave. The Bible doesn't say fight the devil and he'll go away. The Bible says resist and he'll leave you alone. He'll flee. He'll come back. Temptation ain't going away. It's not. It's not. I know y'all love me to tell you, if you'll just say this prayer, you'll never be tempted again. No, nope, I'm sorry. That's why, most, that's why most of us are jacked up like it is because we believe that lie. But God will deliver you. He'll, give you the, he'll deliver you from the evil, but he'll give you the strength. And he said, I'm not going to lead. God doesn't have to lead you into temptation because he led Jesus into temptation. And you're in him. And here's what we're going to do. When you leave this altar, I need everybody that's not up here. You're going to stretch out your hands. And it's what I'm asking you to do. We go, we're leaving, we're leaving. Everybody that's not up here, I want you, when we say amen, I want you to hug somebody that is. Because here's the problem we have in church. Lazarus, come forth. And we come to an altar, and we get delivered. We overcome that thing. But we're still in grave cloths. 
we're still bound by stuff that is attached to us from the season we just came out of. But Jesus didn't take the Lazarus. Jesus did not take the grave cloths off of Lazarus. He looked at the people and said, "Y'all do it." In other words, I've I've delivered them. Now you help them. And so everybody that's in this place, I want you to hug somebody. And you just tell them, "Hey." I'm with you. I'm with you in this. You don't have to worry about being judged. You don't have to worry about anybody thinking a certain way. We are all in this thing together, and I help you. If you need help taking them grave clothes off, you, you just let me know. And we will pull off condemnation. We will pull off the guilt. We will pull off the shame. Why? Because whom the Lord has made new is a new creation in Christ Jesus. Throw your hands up right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, deliver us from the evils of the world, the snares of the enemy that have come to try to keep us from walking in the fulfilled destiny that you have promised. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is enough for us to overcome any, any temptation of sin. So we have been strengthened, we have been empowered, we have been equipped to walk in the fullness of freedom that Christ paid for. And that means freedom from the bondage of any temptation that is on the horizon trying to draw me in. So, Lord, strengthen me so that I will make the right choices and walk in the true identity of who I am. Not forfeiting my identity, not forfeiting my purpose, not forfeiting my calling, but walking in the fullness, knowing that I have been set free by you. And, Lord, who you set free is free indeed. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. In your name, Jesus. Somebody shout amen. 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 Somebody give God some praise in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Hug somebody on your way out.